اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و حبیبنا حبیب اله العالمین محمد و علی آله الطیبین الطاهرین المعصومین المنتجبین I pray that, inshallah, up till now, our fasts and our prayers have been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, in the remaining days and nights of Ramadan, we will have the privilege of uh, having a sort of uh, a approach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will give us the blessings of muttaqeen and the blessings of awliya Allah, inshallah. Uh, my brother Shaykh Hanif said that he's going to continue with khutbatul muttaqeen after Ramadan. So I thought that I would approach the qualities of muttaqeen from a different perspective. And I thought that all these qualities are compressed in one verse of the Quran in Surah at tawbah and the verse, which is connected to the previous verse, talks about certain qualities which are both individual and social. Now I read the two verses, and then inshallah we will discuss the contents of these verses during the nights which uh, we will be together inshallah. Verse 111 in Surah Tawbah says, Inna Allah ashtara من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة. Allah buys from the mu'minin their souls and their property, their selves and what they have, what they own, in return for paradise. In return of that, there will be paradise for them. يقاتلون في سبيل الله. They fight for the sake of God and they kill and they are killed. This is a promise which God has made in the Torah, in Injil, and in the Quran. And who would fulfill the promise? better than Allah. فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا بِبَيْعِكُمُ الَّذِي بَيَعْتُمْ بِهِ وَذَلَكَ هُوَ الْفَوْضُ الْعَظِيمُ So rejoice with the trade that you have made and this is a huge success. And then the qualities of these people who fight, who kill, who are killed. What are the, those qualities? أَتَّعِبُونَ ال عابدون الحامدون الصائهون الراكعون الساجدون العامرون بالمعروف والناهون عن المنكر والحافظون لحدود الله وبشر المؤمنين Those who repent, those who worship, those who praise, those who fast الصائهون will have a discussion about the meaning of صائهون but for the time being, we translate as those who fast. Those who bow down are raqeun, those who prostrate as sajidun, and those who bid good and forbid evil, and those who protect hududullah and give good news to mu'minun. Now, there are several things we understand from these two, verse, two verses. First of all, God is using a sort of uh, parable. It simulates the relationship we have with God in this relation as a trade. Of course, there is no trade-off. There is nothing to be sold. There is nothing to be bought because our souls and our property are, u are useless for God and they are property of God itself. So there is no meaning for selling off our 
souls or our property to God, God is actually using this example to tell us how important it is to enter into such a relationship with God. It's just like God is buying certain things from you and in, and in uh, response to that, as a price of that, he's giving you something, the paradise. You are earning the paradise by, by a trade, by a transaction. You are actually owning it through this transaction. Now, of course, this is very honorable of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak in this way. Because, as I said, we do not own our souls. It is property of God, true property of God. You know that God's ownership is not like ownership, our ownership, which we conventionally own something. We own, for example, a building or a, or a house or something due to a convention. That building has no relationship with us. It has been built by someone else and it will continue after we die. But God's ownership is very different. We cease to exist if this connection is cut with God. We cease to exist without God. So it's a true ownership. Just like you own your imaginations, you own your dreams. They do not exist without you. They depend on you. This is the type of ownership that God has with regards to us. So he owns us and he owns, and, uh, owns everything in this universe in the sense that everything is dependent on that. However, because he has empowered us and he has given us some control he says that okay now i have given you the control of your soul the control of your property i buy it back now you sell it to me and in as a price of it i will give you the paradise question god what is our soul and our property what use you have for them? What do you do with them? What does it mean that you buy it? Well, there is, as I said, there is no transaction as such. God is only honoring us with some sort of freedom, with some sort of decision. Okay, you say you think that you own your soul and your property. You think that this belongs to you, not, be, not to me. Then I will buy it from you. Now, what to do? How do you buy it? You do good things with your, with your life. In, in effect, you have given me your life. You have given your life in my service. That's how I buy it from you. Or you spend your property for my sake. Give it to the poor. Give it to wherever there is a need. Spend it in charity. That is how I buy it from you. I buy that from you and you get the price for it. The paradise. And, of course, the highest, the highest case of this trade would be when you go to a battle for the sake of God, to jihad, and then you submit your soul to God. This belongs to him, but we submit it to him in return for paradise. That is the, that's what is mentioned here. يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ This is not the only way for this trade, the only possible example of this trade, but this is one of the most outstanding cases of this trade. You sell your soul, your life, and you get something in return. يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Now, this jihad is a very... Uh, unfortunate term in our age it has become such a vulgar sort of concept which is being traded off very easily with a very low price jihad which has actually been used by certain muslims nowadays to blemish and to dishonor the whole idea of islam the whole venture of Islam is a lofty position, as Amir al Mu'minin says, "Inna al jihad babum min abwab al jannah fatahu Allah lekhasati awliyah." It is one of the gates of paradise, which is 
only opened by God for his special friends, jihad. Now, what do we see of jihad nowadays? We see that exactly those things which were forbidden in jihad, while the prophet was waging jihad, of course, all the prophet's jihads were defensive. He, didn't, he never attacked anywhere, except in the conquest of Mecca, where he marched to go back and not to fight. And they, of course, surrendered because they had to let that huge army in. And no war took place. All other battles of the Prophet were all defensive battles. Now, he forbid, he did forbid killing non-competents, the old, the young, destroying property, destroying the environment. All these were forbidden. Now, what do we see of these jihadis today? They exactly leave the combatants safe and they kill the non-combatants, the old, the young, the innocent, and they call it a jihad. That is very interesting. You see how concepts and, uh, and terms have changed meaning. And unfortunately, this is what non-Muslims and Muslims see as jihad, and then they say, well, there shouldn't be such a thing in Islam. We shouldn't have jihad in Islam. Jihad should only mean internal struggle in the way of God. Well, of course, if this is jihad, we are all uh, away from that. We all despise this type of jihad. This is not, of course, that jihad which Allah means in the Quran. It is a jihad where people are trying to, to obstruct the way of God. And they come as combatants to battle, to battlefield, then you go and fight them to remove that obstruction. Or when they try to destroy what God has built on the earth as uh, the lamppost for, for human beings, then of course you have to defend it. God is not going to defend it. God is not going to, uh, we cannot leave these things to God. God has actually delegated the job to us to defend this lamppost, this uh, light which he has uh, sent down to us on the earth. If it was not for some people driving off others, not letting them to destroy whatever guidance has been built on the earth, if it was not for that, لَخُدِّمَتْ مَسَاجِعُ وَبِيَعٌ وَصَلَوَاتٌ لَخُدِّمَتْ سَوَامِعُ وَبِيَعٌ وَصَلَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدُ يُذْكَرُ فِي حَسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا The churches, the synagogues, the temples, the mosques, all of them would have been destroyed because there is always this drive in certain people to destroy these things. Who should defend it? It's us who should defend it. Did but based on certain principles. So, this is something, this is a promise given in Torah, in the Quran, and in the Injil, because all of them come from the same source. Anything which is said in the Quran is said in the Torah and is said in the Injil. However, of course, the unfortunate thing is that the Torah is very much changed and uh, uh, we can just see the, the difference between Torah and the Quran when we go to the story of the prophets. Actually, with the exception of a couple of prophets, all the prophets, at some time they worshipped idols, or they committed adultery, or they committed uh, murder. This is how the picture of the prophets are uh, are, are, are this, uh, depicted for us in the Torah. And while you see that they were all far, far away from such blemishes, and the Quran gives us a different picture. Th that is that change. Angel is not with us, unfortunately, because uh, it was revealed to Prophet Isa, salam, but Prophet Isa did not have it written down for, for what reason, we don't know. It was only sentences of that holy book which. Isa preached to people, were written by his disciples, and they are now collected in 
uh, in, in different books as the seerah of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. These books are not with us, but Allah cannot have more than one book and one religion. If other books have come, they have just come to redress what were lost from the previous books. God has only one religion. This I have, of course, reiterated uh, repeatedly. There is no Christianity, Judaism, Islam, with the capital I that we know. It's only one religion preached by all the prophets. And then, of course, after each prophet, the religions needed to be redressed, to be, uh, to, 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 to be corrected, because, of course, the mischiefs and undoings of certain people about those religions. And this has happened, of course, I don't say this has ha hasn't happened with regards to Islam. We know how many different uh, sects were generated after Islam. The only thing about Islam, the last religion, is that the book is kept intact. That is the most important thing. And that's, that's why the, the prophethood is finished now, because we don't need prophets anymore, because the book is left intact, has reached us without uh, any change and variation. Now, of course, our understanding, our explanations, our commentaries, our interpretations of the book may be different, and we don't know who's right, who's wrong, um, if someone wants to judge from outside. However, the good thing is that the book is with us. And the poor thing about uh, previous prophets, I don't say previous religions, God never uses the term religion for these sectarian sort of uh, uh, differences. He uses the term parties. Christianity is a party. Judaism is a party. Sunnism is a party. Shiism is a party. There is only one religion. The parties differed about the book of God, about the religion of God. He doesn't say religions. Because there is only one religion of God. There are no, not many religions. And then parties were generated afterwards. Each sect trying to, uh, to talk about their own party in, in a sense. And what all this tells us is that when we deal with each other, with different, different religions or different persuasions in one religion, Sunni and Shi'i, Islam and Christianity, we, do, we shouldn't think that we have different faiths. There is one faith. We have to discuss it and educate each other to learn about that one religion, not thinking that God, okay, God has sent Jesus to Christians and Muhammad, peace be upon him, to, to Muslims. No. God has sent all prophets to all. And there is only the, the only problem arises when we try to actually monopolize certain teachings and add certain things to them and say that this is our religion. Now, on the day of judgment, God says, this is your party. This is not your religion. This is your hezb and not your deen. Deen is only one. So, uh, this is a promise. Wa'dan alayhi haqqan. Rejoice with this trait. Rejoice with this business that you have made with God. Because, you know, there is, a, there is an example we have in Persian literature that once uh, Prophet Suleiman, peace be on him, had an open day. Everyone went to greet him, to, to say salam to Suleiman. And actually, the kings usually had a salam day when people went and greeted them. And maybe, maybe, one interpretation of salamun hiya hatta matla al fajr in Laylatul Qad, there is greeting, not peace, greeting in it until the dawn, until the break of the dawn. One meaning is that because God is king of the universe. He has that open day of greeting where everyone can go and greet him and receive something in return. And that's the salam day 
well salam night of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laylatul qadr is the salam night because allah usually prefers nights instead of day day is for human beings night is that moment where you could sit with your lord alone and talk to him and befriend with him and he says if you want to make friend with me i'm ready now just imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing himself down to our level. If you want to bring, be, be friend with, you want to sit with me and talk to me, I'm more willing than you. And Ajali Suman Jalasani Musa alayhi salam said that, Oh God, are you far so that I call out? Or you are close so that I whisper? He said, Anajali Suman Jalasani. If you want to sit with me, I'm beside you. The only thing is that we are not willing to sit with God. God is very much willing to sit with us. Now, he had that open day. Okay, we are digressing from the topic. Suleiman had that open day. And all the different commanders from different types and species of animals. Because under him were, of course, not only ants and gen, but different types of animal. وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجَنِّ وَالطَّيْرِ Not all animals, the birds, all birds, were, of course, his troops. And also the ants were his troops. They could, they could communicate with Suleiman. Suleiman could understand them. Don't think that this is myth, this is a story. It may be possible. Now the knowledge, the science is finding out how dolphins talk to each other and call each other by their own names. In the past, we were in, in dark and ignorance. We didn't, we, we didn't think that animals have such, such power and ability. Now, they say that one, one uh, ant came to Suleiman, and he wanted to bring a gift on that greeting day, on the day of Salam, wanted to bring a gift to Suleiman. And he had a leg of a grasshopper because that's the most delicious food that they can have. Leg of a grasshopper, he brought it for Suleiman as a gift. Because this is what he understands or she understands of, of, of a good gift. Suleiman took it and said, reward him. How? Suleiman, what are you going to do with that, that leg of a grasshopper? He said, it's not important what I'm going to do with it. It's important that that ant wanted to show his tributes. Now, it's not important what God does with our souls or our property. He does nothing. He doesn't need it. It's what we are showing to him. So, I accept it as a trade. And you rejoice of that trade. What I am giving you is paradise in no scales, in no way. In no measure, paradise could be measured with our souls or our property or anything like that. In no measure. Let alone forget about God, just paradise. If we can imagine what paradise is, we have, of course, a very childish uh, concept of paradise usually. But if we really can imagine to our limited human worldly capacity what paradise is, we would realize that what honor Allah is is giving us okay now these combatants or these people who are making that trade-off with their souls and their property with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have certain qualities not any child can just put around themselves some explosive and go to the market and explode it and then they say we will have paradise they have certain qualities. What are those qualities? at ibun And even if, if, not for jihad, even if you want to spend your life for God, in the service of God, if you want to spend your property, your money, for the service of God, then you have to have these qualities. These are the conditions of the person who wants to make business with God. These are the conditions. الطائبون العابدون الحامدون السائهون الراكعون what I, I went through before 
we will inshallah deal with each one of these qualities one by one and tomorrow night inshallah we'll discuss about at-ta'ibun those who repent now tonight i want to mention a couple of hadith about uh, Amir al muminin alayhi salam who passed away in in such a day in ramadan in kufa there are heartbreaking traditions about what happened after the after Amir al muminin was hit one of them is uh, what Asbaq ibn Nubata Asbaq ibn Nubata is uh, one of the close companions of Amir al Mu'mineen and he is the one who actually reports to us the, uh, the Malik Ashtar's uh, uh, covenant that Amir al Mu'mineen wrote to him he is the one who reports it and he is a member of Shurtatul Khamis Shurtatul Khamis was a term used for those line-breaking soldiers who went in f ahead of everyone else to break the lines of the enemy and open the way for the backup to come and fight. And these Shurtatul Khamis, they had made, of course, Amir Amin appointed no one to this battalion of Shurtatul Khamis except they made the pledge of Shahada that we, when we go to break the line, we go forward or we die. We never come back. We never turn our backs to enemies. So these were the people who had made this pledge and this Asbaq ibn Nubata are one of them. Most of the members of this battalion, when they heard Amir al muin was hit, they came round the door, the, the house of Amir al muin you can, you can imagine what a dull and grim day was the day of the 19th when they heard that Amir al muin was hit in the mosque and they all came round his house. And Asabaq ibn Nubata says that uh, uh, I with a couple of others from that Shurtatul Khamid, Haris, Wasumaid ibn Qafala and Jama'atun and the group of us were just sitting, sitting on the ground, on the soil, outside the house because of course there was no room for everyone to go inside the house outside the house we were sitting and with certain intervals we were hearing the cries were the loud cries were coming and we started to cry as well as I said it was a very very grim situation and after we cried and our cries were so loud that people in the house were hearing us Hassan ibn Ali came out and said that Amir al muminin says that please disperse do not stand here do not stay here and uh, upon that statement everyone dispersed but my feet could not carry me I couldn't go I was just sitting on the ground could not move at all so I sat there after everyone went and again the the, the cries of uh, uh, the, 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 the people, the, the, the women in the house were loud. I started to cry again. Again, Hassan ibn Ali came out and said, Asbaq, didn't I tell you that leave this place? He said, yes, I want to leave my Lord. However, my feet would not carry me. I want to hear the last words from Ali ibn Abi Talib because they knew that they are going to lose Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now. I want to hear the last words from him. He said, okay, let me see if Amir al muminin is willing to meet you. And he, he went home, he went inside and came back and said, okay, enter. He says, I went in and I saw Amir al muminin was leaning against the wall, quite weak, completely weak. And he had uh, 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 a yellow cloth round his head. They had actually bandaged the head dressed the head with that and his face was so so yellow had so pale that I couldn't say which one was more yellow the the cloth or his face 
And uh, as soon as I, I saw him, I fell upon his feet and started to cry. He said, La tabkiya asbakh. Do not cry, asbakh. Fa inna wallah al jannah. I swear to God that I'm just going to paradise. Why do you cry? He said, I'm crying not because of you. Of course I know you are going to paradise. I cry because we are losing you. And he says that he, had, he was in such a pain that he was frequently lifting his legs, one leg after another, just the pain that he was feeling from both the, the strike of the sword and, of course, the poison, the poison which was with which the sword uh, was marinated in. And uh, uh, Amir al-Mumin says, didn't you hear what Hassan say? Why are you waiting outside the, home, the house? He said, yes, but I would have liked to once again look at you and hear from you. And Amir al mumin started to uh, say, okay, you want a hadith from me, I will tell you a hadith from the Prophet, peace be on him. And I don't think that you will hear any hadith from me after that. And it's a very beautiful hadith. We don't have time for that, unfortunately, for that. As maybe tomorrow, maybe, maybe, because tomorrow we are actually going out of the occasion. But there is one other thing which I want to mention. Maybe you have not heard this before. But the implications of this, his historical report, is so sad, so dramatic, that everyone should ponder, Ya Allah, why this happened? Why this happened to this woman? Now, I'll, I read this historical piece first, and then we'll ponder upon the implications of that piece. Ibn Abel Hadith, the, the Sunni Mu'tazili scholar who has written a sharh on Nahjul Balagha, he says that uh, when Amirul Mu'minin passed away and they wanted to bury him, they tried to hit the place of his burial from Banu Umayyah, lest they come and uh, dig the grave and uh, bring the, the, the holy body of Imruin out and desecrate it. Now, why this should happen? Amir al Mu'minin, okay, you did not believe that he was the wasi of the Prophet. You did not believe that he was wali al Mu'minin. You did not, but you believed that he was a caliph, a rightful caliph. You believe that he was a companion of the Prophet. Why this should happen? Why in history, just let's think, why both the daughter of the Prophet and Amir al the Wasi of the Prophet, they have to be buried at night in a way that no one should know where they were buried. That was a Siddiqa of the Ummah. This is a Siddiqa of the Ummah. Why this should happen? What did go wrong? What did go wrong? This is a question. Now he says that uh, they, on that night, they made a coffin, a, a, a chest, a coffin, and filled it with camphor and other things which they usually uh, put on the, on the deceased. And they send it with some companions of Amir al-Mu'minin to Medina. So that people think that Amir al Mu'minin is sent to Medina to be buried beside the prophets. They made another coffin, and with some uh, people, they sent it to Hira. And some say that they just left the, the, the camel on the way and came back because they knew that nothing was in that coffin. Even in Kufa, they digged several graves. Ibn Abdul Hadith says that they did, uh, they digged in the courtyard of the mosque several graves. They digged in the courtyard of Darul Emara several graves. They digged in Kanasa 
in Stoia several graves. And they did not bury Amir al-Mu'in in, no, in any of these graves. Why it was so important that no one should have known about it? What an animosity, what a hatred towards the one who won the battle of Badr and Khaybar and Hunayn and Uhud. All those people who were injured on those times, they wanted to take their revenge, if not from Amir al-Mu'minin alive, from his, his dead corpse. They wanted to take revenge. What did go wrong in Islam? Just let's think. What happened? And then, of course, Amir al muin himself had mentioned where he had to be buried. He had told Al-Hasan and al Hussein Ali Salam and Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, the three sons, that when I pass away and you wash me and you shroud me in night, no one should know. You put me in a coffin, you take the back of the coffin and leave the front. The angels would lift it and take it. Just like the chest of Banu Israel, as the Quran says, The angels would carry that chest. This coffin of Amir al-Mu'in was carried by the angels towards Najaf. And probably no one knew that where Amir al-Mu'minin, he said, when you go there, you find a naked grave and bury me there. And no one probably knew, except Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, who were Imams, that just beside that grave was buried Nuh alayhi salam and Adam alayhi salam. And he was buried beside Nuh and Adam alayhi salam. And for about a hundred years, about a hundred years, the place of the grave of Amir al Mu'minin was unknown. Until Banu Umayyah were toppled, Banu Abbas came, then that, those grudges of Badriyat and Wahaybariyat and Wahonainiyah were called down. Then, of course, Imam Ja'far Sadiq showed the place of the grave of Amir al Mu'minin. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inshallah give us the, the blessing of followership of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Siddiq of the Ummah, and to bless us with the remaining days and nights of Ramadan with his forgiveness and with his kindness. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ala tahiri. Allah, wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.